Welcome to the final session of Stone Suit Group's virtual parent conference. Really excited to see everyone and see so many returning faces. Today's the final session of, um, of four that we've had over the past month. Um, I'm Mary Middleton, the executive director here for Stone Soup Group. Um, and we really are excited to, to have all of you with us today to hear Yari Walker speak about the importance of culture in leading a person-directed life. Um, there are a lot of people who have worked really hard to make these four sessions possible over the past month. Um, and we have a lot of sponsors who have contributed as well. Uh, I want to take just a second to thank them. Um, this year's sponsors include the Alaska Brain Injury Network, the Alaska Mental Health Trust Authority, All for Kids Pediatric Therapy, the Arc of Anchorage, Bering Straits Native Corporation, the Down Syndrome Network, Matt Nuska Telephone Association Foundation, the Matsu Health Foundation, Reading Right Alaska, and CISA, the Special Education Service Agency. A big thank you to them for making this possible. Before we get started today, just really quickly for housekeeping, the session um, is being recorded. All four of the sessions have been recorded and all of them will be available um, after we finish today. Um, everyone is currently muted, but you can unmute yourself for questions. You can also um, post questions in the chat box and Stone Soup Group staff are monitoring those. Um, so you can leave questions or comments there and um, and we will get to them. So for today, um, Gary Walker is, is here to, to talk to us about, about culture and what that means in, in leading a person-directed life. Um, I am going to turn it over for her to do an introduction of herself now. Thank you so much for joining us, Yari. Good afternoon, everybody. I would like to especially thank Alexandra for inviting me to be a part of this. Some of you guys were on my tour at the Alaska Native Hair Center, and that's how Stone Group found me to do this for you today. I would like to do a traditional introduction before I start. So in the Alaska Native cultures, when we introduce ourselves, we always state our name, the land we come from, and who our family is, because those are the most important things to us. So what I said in my Yupik name is, uh, thank you for having me. My Yupik name is Yari. I am Northern Yupik. There's a huge difference between the Northern Yupik and the Southern Yupik, and you're going to learn that today. I am originally from St. Lawrence Island, which is close to 700 miles from Anchorage. It's northwest of here. I'm from the village of Sivunga. My clan, we are a patrilineal society. My, our clan system comes from our father's side. So our clan is called Aymaramka, which translates into strong people. Our sub-clan is Sanmeramaluk. We are people of the reindeer. And my mother's clan is Kiwami, people of Kiwa. That's who I am. And I'm going to ask the facilitator to please bring up the language map. I'm going to do the introduction of the uh, Alaska Native people. Thank you, Katie. So Alaska Native people, we have 12 groups, 11 of them are indigenous to Alaska, and I'm going to start off in the pink or the red because both you and I are on the traditional hunting grounds of the Alaska Native people if you're in the Anchorage area. And if you look on the map there, Anchorage is located on Denaina land, or some people say Denaina. So I like to start off with them first. And if you look on the map there, the Denaina people expand into Canada and also down states. Um, a long time ago, we never had borders. These borders were created for us, so our people expand from Russia, Alaska, Canada, all the way into Greenland. So the Athabascan people have relatives in Canada, and they are actually linguistically related to the Apaches and also the Navajos, and the Navajo people traditionally call themselves Dene, just like the Athabascan people also call themselves Dene. And their clan system is opposite of ours. They are a matrilineal society. 
And if you look on the map there, there are 11 separate groups, which means um, they actually have 11 different languages and 22 different dialects, which is pretty amazing for uh, a group of people to have 11 different languages and 22 different dialects. So that's the Athabascan people. And moving on to the, um, the South Central area, we have the EAC people in the orange. And then in Southeast Alaska, we have the Flinket, and they do expand into Canada. And we also have the Haida or the Hada people and the Simsian people. The Simsian people actually are not native to Alaska. They came from old Metlakatla from British Columbia. There was a man named William Duncan, who was a Presbytery missionary man who brought some Simsian people to Alaska for religious freedom. And when they arrived to Alaska in 1887, the Tlingit people gave them Annette Island as a gift. And there's one village on Annette Island called Metlakatla. And Metlakatla is actually the only reservation in the state of Alaska. And the reason why we have one reservation is because when ANCSA was introduced to Alaska Native people in 1971, the Simshian people decided to opt out of ANCSA because Annette Island was gifted to them, so they did not want to take part in, in ANCSA. But you'll understand about ANCSA a little bit more. So Southeast Alaska is part of the Tongass rainforest. It rains on average about 15 feet a year. And the people of Southeast Alaska have a clan system just like the Athabascan people, matrilineal. And um, the two major clans of the EAC people is Eagle and Bear. Clinket and Haida people have Eagle and Raven. And the Simshan people have four, which, is, which are Eagle, Raven, Killer Will, and Wolf. And moving on to the light blue area, we have the Alutuk people, also known as the Sukhbiak people. Alutuk is actually a Russian given term. So in traditional times, they call themselves Sukhbiak, but some people do refer to themselves as Aleut. Um, but I'll explain that to you a little bit later. And when I listen to the Sukhbiak people speak their native language, I'm able to understand up to about 75, maybe 80% of their language, which I think is pretty cool because growing up, I used to think that I can understand more Southern Yupik uh, than anything else. But when I met some Sukhbiak elders and, and I heard them, when I listened to them speak their language, it, I was really surprised of how much I can understand their language. And then uh, moving on to the Aleutian chain, we have the Aleut, who again is a Russian given term. Traditionally, they call themselves Unanga. Before the Russians arrived to the Aleutian Islands in 1741, they asked the Koryak people, the native people of Russia, if there was people on the Aleutian Islands. And of course, the Koryak people don't speak Russian, so they misunderstood them. And they were trying to explain to them that there is these Aleutian Islands. So when the Russians arrived, when they saw the Unangah people, they called them Aleut. And I mentioned earlier, there are some Sukhbiak people who refer themselves as Aleut. Uh, so that has, has been ingrained in them by the Russian people. Um, I'll, I'm also going to teach you a little bit history, Alaska Native perspective, because across the country, history is taught based on one culture only. So the word Alaska comes from the Unangah people. Traditionally, they say Alaska. And the translation of that word is where the sea breaks its back. If I ask you to pull out your phones and Google the definition of Alaska, most of you are going to find the great land, which is not even true. Alaska, where the sea breaks its back. Once there was a Bering Land Bridge when Alaska and Russia were connected. When the sea came, it split it apart. That's where that term comes from, where the sea breaks its back. Uh, U.S. history teaches that Alaska was purchased by the United States from the Russians, which is not even true. When the Russians arrived in 1741, they'd never been to interior Alaska. they have never been to the northern part of Alaska. And they thought Alaska was nothing but a waste of space. And they saw no value in Alaska. And that's what made them decide not to settle here. 
but they did enslave the Unach people to get fur seal and sea otter. Uh, that's all they wanted. So by the time the U.S. government arrived, the only thing that the Russians sold to them was the right to trade for fur seal and sea otter from the people of the Aleutian Islands. And the U.S. government actually sees 90% of the Alaska Native people lands. And if you're running to an angry native, um, that could be part of the reason because they, uh, a lot of them say that the government stole 90% uh, of our lands. Sheldon Jackson, who was a Presbyterian missionary man, arrived to Alaska in 1881. By that time, by the time he arrived was when the U.S. government was seizing the lands of the native people. He stopped them. And um, the U.S. government realized they were wrong, so they stopped. The 10% of the lands that they didn't seize from us, they offered to buy them from the native people. And when the U.S. government offered to buy St. Lawrence Island from my people, my people said no. And so uh, we did not sell St. Lawrence Island to the U.S. government. Um, there's a piece of land right here in Anchorage that does not belong to the U.S. government because their people chose not to sell their land, and that's the land of the Denina people, um, which, which is where Alaska Native Heritage Center is built. Um, we also have the village of Vinatai, White Mountain, and Elam in the northwestern part of Alaska. These, pe these uh, villages opted out of what we call ANCSA, which stands for Alaska Native Claim Settlement Act. Um, and then the blue area, central Yupik, I did mention earlier, there's a big difference between a northern Yupik and a southern Yupik. If you look at the map there, St. Lawrence Island is covered kind of a teal color. Um, it's closer to Russia, mainland Russia, than it is Alaska. We are the northern Yupiks, and then the central Yupiks are the southern Yupiks. Um, if you look on the map there, a lot of their villages are along the rivers or the coastal areas because that's where their resources come from. There's a village called Tivak, or in their language they say Tivak. And on Nunavak Island there, uh, that blue island there, is called Nunavak, and there's a village called Makoriak. Those people call themselves Jupig. So we have the Yupik, Jupik, and the Jupig people. Uh, when I listen to them speak, I can understand more Jupi more than I can Jupi in Central Yupi. Uh, the difference between a Northern Yupi and a Southern Yupi is my people of St. Lawrence Island, our lifestyle and our subsistence way of life, our stories and our beliefs are pretty much identical to the Inupiaq people, so I actually relate myself closer to a Inupiaq than I do a Central Yupi. And then, like I mentioned, uh, northern Yupik and northwestern part of Alaska is home to the Inupiaq. And then the St. Lawrence Island Yupik, or some people call us Siberian Yupiks. Um, I don't call myself a Siberian Yupik because I'm not from Siberia. I'm from St. Lawrence Island. And if you look 35 miles across in Russia, there's a place called, there's a region called Chukotka. Uh, in Russia, you'll see a teal colored. Those are my people. We speak the same exact language as the people of Chukotka. Uh, but when I listen to the people of Chukotka speak their language, they speak it with a Russian accent and they speak it really fast. And they tease us and say that uh, we speak our Yupik uh, language with an American accent, which I think is pretty funny. So that's the Alaska Native people. I wanted to introduce them to you guys because I feel that you should know who you're working with. Um, because it'll help you better understand who we are. Some of us are classified as Eskimos, Indians, or Aleuts, but none of these words come from us. The word Eskimo is a Cree word. Traditionally, the way you pronounce that word is Eskimoak, and the translation of that word is eaters of raw meat. That's not what I want to be called, so to me it's a derogatory term. So for those of you who like to eat sushi or eat your steak raw, please raise your hands. I'm going to give you a second to raise your hands. Raise your hands. Don't be afraid. All right. For those of you who raise your hands, guess what? It doesn't matter if you're red, white, yellow, or black. You are an Eskimo if, you're, if you are a raw meat eater. So the word Indian is a, a Christopher Columbus term. 
uh, Christopher Columbus thought he landed in India when he saw the indigenous people of North America, he called them Indians. So that's how that term came to be. And I already mentioned to you uh, where the word Aleut comes from. So that's who we are as Alaska Native people. Does anybody have any questions for me about Alaska Native cultures or people before we move on to the next part? Raise your hand if you have any questions. Go ahead, please. Hi, Yari. Hi, Mary. It's Karen. <laughs> Karen. Hi, Karen. I'm sorry. I apologize. Um, uh, yes, I do uh, okay. understand you. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. Cool. It's pretty interesting. I understood what you said to me. Yeah, thank you for being here. Anybody else? I can't see the chat box in case anybody has any questions. No. Okay, let's go ahead and move on to the next slide, please. I'm going to go ahead and give you guys a moment to read this. I wrote this based on my personal experiences. Um, because my worldviews in 1997 were very different compared to the Western culture worldviews. Um, being married to a non-Native man has, uh, has really taught me about myself and my culture and made me realize this is why we do things in my culture. So I'm gonna give you guys a few minutes to read this and as you read this, please do think about questions or things you want me to talk about more so you can better understand it. So I'm going to give you guys about five minutes to read it. Go ahead and start reading it.
So I would like for us to have a discussion on this. Please don't mind the typos. I realize there's typos. Um, I'm also dyslexic, so sometimes I put uh, things backwards. So let's have a discussion on the writing. What came to your mind? Is there something that you'd like to understand better? Do you have any questions? Is there something you want me to touch on a little bit more? Because now is the time. I like what you had to say and what you wrote. And I think when working with families and whatnot, we always need to remember that we often have our respect backwards, meaning that we respect things um, such as people buying big houses and um, having jobs and that are um, from professional level things, um, situations. And a lot of times we don't give the respect that we need to other situations similar to what you said. And too often we don't put love first. We um, let our judgment happen a little too soon because we don't know what it's like to be in the shoes of the people that we work with sometimes. And it's hard for mm -hmm. us to imagine until someone tells us our story. And we have to let people tell stories before they're judged. But uh, we don't get to see people for very long and we don't get to know them. And that's where I think we um, have our respect backwards is what I call it. What part of the writing are you talking about? I kind of have an idea. Hmm. Was this a part where I was talking about how people should, should be seen as equal? Yes, equal and also all throughout your conversation, you know, having one culture, uh, cultural experience versus another. And uh, yeah, I think yep. you speak to that all the time. Um, and we need to be mindful of that always. Yes. Um, I'd like to touch on that a little bit. When I first moved here and I observed Western culture, uh, to me, according to my observations, um, it seemed like in the Western culture, um, there was a lot of inequality. There was no equality. There was no equity. It just felt that way to me. And that's what the system created. Um, so that's why when I, when I talk about respecting all walks of life, respecting people's roles, I talk about how we as people in, in these places, villages, towns, and cities, we work, we live in these places because we do need each other on a day, daily basis for survival purposes. And people don't realize that even bus drivers and people who stock groceries or work at the gas station, these people also help make up, make up communities. And there was a woman in California, I want to say maybe in January, there was a news, news about her, and I saw the news on social media, and people were attacking her because in this news, um, it was talked about that she has a hairdresser and has a second job and has a hard time making ends meet. And a lot of people attacked her saying stuff like, well, go to college and get a better paying job. And, and I thought about it. And my response to that was, let's take away all the hairdressers in the United States. Who's going to do your hair? Even hairdressers have important roles. And when COVID-19 happened and all these people were protesting, I want to get a haircut. And that was the first thing I thought about was the woman from California. I feel like uh, with COVID and when everything shut down, that was the eye, up, eye opener for people to see that grocery store workers, hairdressers, all these people have important roles. So in my culture, we teach people to treat, uh, treat people with the same respect. You don't look down on people and you don't look, you don't look above. Um, you, you just treat everybody with the same respect. So I'm glad you brought that up. So thank you. Anybody else? There's one comment in the chat that says sitting in silence is okay. Exactly. Um, my non-native husband um, 
when I wanted to spend time with him, he lo- he he used to play Xbox like hours on end, but it's not like that anymore, thank goodness. But one day I asked him to get off his Xbox and spend time with me. And, you know, when I ask him to, t- to get off, he doesn't have a problem with it. He'll shut, out, shut it off and help me or spend time with family or whatever it is I'm asking him to do. But he shut his Xbox off and we sat on the couch and we were silent. And my husband asked me if I had something I wanted to talk about. I said, no, I don't. And he said, I thought you wanted to spend time. I said, I do. And then, you know, we were silent for a few seconds. And he asked me again. And he says, "Um, um, what do you want to talk about? I said, I currently have nothing to say. And he said it again. I thought you wanted to spend time. I said, I do. And then I realized To him, uh, spending time means I have something to talk about. So when I realized that, I said, um, spending time to me doesn't mean we have to talk. I just want your presence. When you're on your Xbox, you're not present. So I just want your presence. So uh, silence is okay. And people I'm not comfortable with, especially people from the Western culture, Um, I feel the need to fill the void by saying, how are you? So basically what I'm saying to them is, I don't really want to know how you're doing, but how are you? I'm just trying to, or I use something like, it's a beautiful day. um, Because I know these people are awkward with silence, so I feel the need to, to fill the void. Guess what would happen if I told my brother it's a beautiful day? Any guesses? If not, my brother would look at me and say, duh, obviously I can see it's a beautiful day. Uh, My brother would rather I have him tell me something he does not know. Uh, And so that's what silence means to me. It means I'm comfortable with my husband. Um, We were on our way to Wasilla or Palmer and I was silent and he asked me if I was mad at him and I asked him, what makes you think I'm mad at you? He said, you're silent. So I said, it doesn't mean I'm mad at you. It means I'm comfortable with you. And I said, if I was not comfortable with you, I would try to fill in the void by asking you, how was your weekend? How are you? It's a beautiful day. This is what I'm planning to do this weekend. Uh, But since I'm comfortable with him, I don't need to mention these things. Uh, does that cover cover that? Anybody else? Either now or forever hold your peace. What about those eyebrows? Nobody, nobody want to ask about the eyebrows. Does anybody know what the uses of the eyebrows are? The uses of the eyebrows in in the Eskimo cultures is a yes. If you raise your eyebrows, it's a yes. Um, when I moved my kids here, when they were in elementary, I realized, oh my gosh, I got to go educate the school, the teacher, and the principal about my children and my culture and and who we are. So I called the school and asked them if I could meet with them and they agreed. So I went to the school, introduced myself and my kids and I educated educated them about my kids and our culture. And when I talked about the raising of the eyebrows and told, I, I told the teacher, if you ask my children a yes or no question, just because they don't verbally respond to you does not mean they're not responding. You got to pay attention to the facial expressions or the shoulders. Um, If you see my children raise their eyebrows, that means they're telling you yes. And the school, the school, my daughter's uh, teacher immediately asked my daughter, are you a princess? And my daughter immediately raised her eyebrows. (laughs) Um, Looks like we have a hand up for Aileen. Go ahead.
No, sorry, that was from just indicating I was done reading. Sorry, I should take my hand off. Oh. But. <laughs> I got you, thanks. Nothing else, huh? I'm pretty surprised. I think All somebody right. was trying to talk, but they were on mute, and I don't know who it was. Sorry, this is Megan. I work at SCF. Okay. Caitlin was doing it. Go ahead, please. No? I'll okay. go. Okay, thank you. You mentioned the shoulders. What do you do with the shoulders? So when I was a depressed teenager, 16 year old, when I was 16 years old, I actually became suicidal. And when I became suicidal, my father uh, requested help from me. And this non-native woman came to my village as my counselor. And when she came into my village in the business suit and the name Tay, she sent me a message that she was only there to do her job. And without realizing that, but many years later when I thought about it, oh, that's exactly why I had that kind of behavior. Now I understand it. Uh, she clearly, to me, she sent me a message that she was only there to do her job. Especially after she introduced herself to me, she told me her name, what her job title was, and who she worked for, and I thought, yep, she's only here to do her job. And then that, that was the moment I decided I'm not going to tell her anything about myself. And then she said, I'm going to do an assessment on you. I'm going to ask you a series of questions, and I want you to answer the best you can. And I said, yep, I'm not going to tell her anything about me uh, because she refused to build a relationship with me. So the assessment began, and all I could do was stare at the floor and shrug my shoulders without saying anything to her. So I was sending a message to her without realizing it. And the things that I was saying with, with my shoulders, the shrug of the shoulders is, I don't know how to answer your question. I don't want to talk to you. You're only here to do your job. You don't care about me, so I don't want to tell you anything. So I was sending her these messages by shrugging my shoulders. That's what shrugging other shoulders means. It doesn't necessarily mean I don't know. It could mean other things like I don't want to talk to you. I don't understand what you're saying. It could mean those things. So you just have to be observant um, of, of the individual. Can you hear me? I can hear you yeah, now. Can hear you. <laughs> I had to go into my settings. I did have a comment way back when, but I was muted in my settings, which are now fixed. Uh, I really liked your article or your writing, and it made me think of like a culture shock. Like you're experiencing the culture shock of being in in uh, Anchorage in the big city, um, which it's funny when – you know, I've had similar situations where I've left and lived somewhere else, and you don't realize it. I'm just curious, have you ever experienced a culture shock going back to your community in the village? Like, I've had that happen to me when I left and went into, like, a culture that had a slower rhythm, and it wasn't so fast-paced and demanding as living in Anchorage. And then when I returned to Anchorage... It took me a while to readjust. Oh, yes. <laughs> it's normal. It's, it's hard to adjust once your physical, emotional, and spiritual being get used to the certain lifestyle. And now when I go back to my village, I really have to remind myself, slow down. Yeah. I don't have to be the one doing all the talking. I got to remember, shut up. Um, when I picked up my father from the airport, I was doing all the talking. I was having so much fun. I was telling my dad all these things. And then I realized, what am I doing? I teach this class all the time. So I shut up. As soon as I shut up and gave my father the pause that he needed, he began to share hunting stories with me. And I'll talk about that a little bit later. So, yes, I do have a culture shock when I go back home because – I am now an urbanized native. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. 
Does anybody else? Um, there's one question in the chat. What kind of advice could you give someone going to a village for outreach for communicating and interacting with those? Oh, people? yeah, we're going to go into that. Trust me, I'm going to be teaching about the communication styles, how to better understand this, and how to build a relationship with us. So speaking of relationships, I would like to talk about the 12-year-old uh, Native girl and also about my daughter uh, when I first moved to her here. I used to work in five different middle schools with troubled Native students. Each day I would go to a different middle school. And Clark Middle School called me in one day and told me that there was a Native girl who refuses to speak to anybody. She has poor grades and poor attendance. So I said, I'm coming in. So when I came in, I witnessed a, uh, what appeared to me was a white woman school counselor and the Native girl. And what I witnessed was the Native girl staring at the floor, shrugging her shoulders. She refused to look at the school counselor and speak to her at all. And my first thought was, I know exactly why she's doing that. And so I waited until the school counselor was finished with her. When she was done, I looked at the Native girl and I said, hi, my name is Yari, it's my Yupik name. And she looked at me and I thought, yes, I got her to look at me. And I said, I know you come from a Native culture, who's your people? She said, I'm Athabascan. And I thought, yes, I got her to say something. And then I said, I know your people have a clan system, who's your clan? And she told me her clan, but I can't remember what it is. So I told her, you know, I'm Yupik from St. Lawrence Island. My clan is Aymarmka. I introduced myself, uh, the Alaska Native way, to let her know I'm here as a human being, not as a school counselor, not as a therapist, not as a job title. I'm here as a human being because I care. So that was a message I was sending to her. And then I didn't ask her a single negative question. When I listened to the school counselor speaking to the Native girl, she was asking her a lot of negative questions. And I thought, who would want to tell a complete stranger about all the negative things that are happening in your life when you didn't even, when you didn't even try to get to know her at all? And so talking to the Athabascan girl, I said, um, what, do you, what do you like about your native culture? She said, I like to cut fish. And I asked her, were you raised at fish camp? She said, yes. I said, me too. And I said, I was 12 years old when my mom taught me how to cut fish. She said, me too. And I said, what else do you like about your Athabascan culture? She said she liked to drum and she liked to dance. I said, me too. I was raised around the drum. So we're going back and forth. And we're talking about each other's cultures, teaching each other. I'm building a relationship with her. I'm sending a message to her. I care about you and where you come from and the things you care about. I want to listen to your story. So now that I, I felt her energy change, now she's excited to tell me about her culture and about herself. And then by, when I felt like she was comfortable enough with me, I said, tell me what you want me to know about school. She said, my favorite subject is math. And I said, I never liked math. And I jokingly said, maybe you can teach me about math. And she laughed. And um, she also said, I like to play basketball. I said, me too. And I asked her, what's your position when you play? She said, point guard. I said, me too. And then I told her that um, I coached high uh, girls high school basketball. And I played basketball for many years before I moved here. Now she feels comfortable with me. I don't ask her anything else. Eventually on her own, she tells me herself, I'm being bullied in school. Now we understand why she has poor attendance and poor grades. She was trying to avoid being bullied in school and, and her way of being, avoid, uh, being bullied was to stay away from school. So it's very important if you're gonna work with Alaska Native people, um, when you come in and tell people, um, just like that uh, counselor did when she came to my village, she sent me a strong message that she didn't care. 
And I did a roundtable discussion with a woman who had either a master's or a doctorate degree. I can't remember which one. By the way, you can find it on YouTube. Um, I forgot what uh, behavioral health organization she worked for. I can't remember what it's called. But there was a TV host myself and a woman who had a degree in psychology, either master's or doctorate. And the topic was Alaska Native people and suicide. And um, she said to me, she said, a message that the Western culture sends to you, not a message from me, is that I know how to help you. I have a degree. I have a psychology degree. So therefore, I know how to help you. You don't know how to help yourself because you don't have a degree. You didn't study and you didn't go to a university. And I looked at her and my response to that was, tell me where across the United States teaches, teaches you how to understand me, my people, and my culture. She pointed the stack of uh, textbooks she had in front of her and she said, maybe one or two sentences for, uh, from these books. And I said, so that sums it up. Now you know how to help me. Because there's one or two sentences in, in these textbooks about my people. So I'm actually going to school in, at Alaska Pacific University and I'm studying psychology. I am teaching my professors the world views of Alaska Native people and how to uh, build a relationship and connect with us. Um, I also have a job at APU now as a indigenous consultant. I am training and teaching uh, faculty, staff, and students about the world views of Alaska Native people. So you you have to be um, aware and mindful of these things. Uh, just, I always tell people just to, it's just because you have a degree in something does not mean you know how to help these people because. Uh, Universities were made for one culture, not based off of a, a diverse group of people. Like, for instance, um, they're not going to teach a class in the universities how to build, build a relationship the Yupik ways. They don't offer those kinds of classes. So you have to be mindful of these kinds of things. Anything else? No? Um, Katie, can you please go ahead and pull up my picture? So I came home from um, one of my classes, I believe it was uh, last fall or two years ago, I can't remember which. And I came home crying from one of my AP classes. And my husband asked me what was wrong. I said, I'm going to fail this class. And my husband said, what makes you think you're going to fail it? I said, my professor speaks too fast. And she jumps from one subject to one subject. I just feel like she's so unorganized. She'll talk about this one subject, move on to the next subject, and come back to this one. And I can't seem to keep up with note taking. I'm going to fail this class. I just, I, my husband gave me an idea and said, why don't you meet your professor and explain to her how you feel in that class? So I requested to meet with her and I said, uh, when I, I told her that I went home crying one day because I felt like she was talking too fast for me and jumping from one subject to one subject. So uh, I did this picture because I wanted her to physically see that this is how I felt in her class. That's why I made this picture for her to see. Um, and you know what her recommendation was her for me? She said, I recommend that you contact these people. Basically, she said that I was disabled, uh, that I needed someone to help me and I don't know, it just made me feel um, like I wasn't um, intelligent enough or I don't know, she just didn't see the culture, understand the cultural difference. I, I just felt like she didn't take it seriously. 
So I was very happy that when I taught the cultural sensitivity training that she was in that class, so I was able to educate her so she could have a better understanding why I felt the way I did. Any questions on this one? Can we move on to the next one, please? All right, there are many different styles of communication. In Anchorage alone, we have over 100 different languages spoken. In 1997, when I moved here, this is how I used to speak English because I used to be so terrified because my grandfather taught me that I needed to think about the words I choose. So I was focusing more on the words I chose to speak versus my tempo, my distance, pitch, any of those things because these things did not matter to me because my grandfather taught me it was very important to think before you speak and choose your words wisely. So I want you guys to think about um, what kind of tempo do you use when you're speaking to people? Do you speak really fast? Or do you speak very, very slow? There are some Alaska Native elders who speak like this very slow. And sometimes they have these really long pauses. And it's awkward for some people to have these long pauses. I have a best friend who has blonde hair, blue eyes. She's Norwegian. She never shuts up. And she speaks at a rate of da 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 And when I pause because I'm thinking, she cuts me off. She cuts me off, and I get really annoyed with her. So I have to remind her these things. So her metronome is da 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 and she cuts me off sometimes. My two beats of metronome are a little bit different than hers. In 1997, mine was da 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 But since I've been here for 23 years, it has changed a little bit. I speak a little bit faster than I did 23 years ago. So raise your hand. And there's no right or wrong answer. Raise your hand if you're one of those people who feel awkward when there's a silence and you feel the need to cut people off. Raise your hand, or you can comment in the chat chat box and let me know that you, you do that. Yeah, I'll talk about my tattoos a little bit later. Did anybody raise their hands? Have both ways. Sabrina says she uses both ways. Anybody else? Any comments? So I'm going to show you uh, the two beats of metronome when you grab my marker real quick. So in 1997, this is how much pause I used to give people. And if nobody jumps in to speak, then I'm going to keep talking. Here's my best friend. That's my best friend on the bottom. That's why she never shuts up. And she's not giving me the pause I need so I can speak. And when I feel uncomfortable to cut people off, especially at work, guess what I used to do? I raise my hand to let them know I have something to say. And my boss, my former boss, Lauren Anderson from Kodiak Island, he knew that to me it was rude to cut people off. So because I have something to say, I'm not given the pause that I need. I used to raise my hand. And my boss, Lauren, used to say, eh, everybody, Yari has something to say. But today I have learned, thanks to my husband and my best friend, 
I am not comfortable with cutting people off. I've learned how to do that. So, my two beats of metronome is a little bit faster than it was in 1997. This is me in the bottom right here, and this is my best friend. She still speaks faster than me. So speaking of cutting you off, Yari, sorry. Um, there's some sound issues happening. I don't know if something... Yeah, I don't know if something changed since the beginning, but it's kind of cut. Let, uh, let me log on to my phone. Is that okay? Yeah. So I'm going to uh, leave for a minute, and we can resume back in three minutes. So let's give everybody a three-minute break. Thank you. Deal. <laughs> Thanks. Okay. Can you go ahead and pull the, uh, the iceberg back, back up? The let the communication. All right. Now that we're back, when you're speaking to people, what kind of pitch do you use? Do you speak really high or do you speak low? I learned according to my observations of the Western culture, it's very important for you to sing the English language if you want to be heard. What happens if I were to do my presentation like this with you guys for? an hour and a half, I probably would put some of you guys to sleep, right? And then what kind of distance do you use when you're speaking to people? Do you use an Italian distance? Or do you use an Englishman distance? What kind of distance do you use? There was a study done between three different culture groups. We have the Italian, Frenchman, and the Englishman. During a course of a 10-minute conversation, you had two Italian men who stood an elbow length apart, they touched each other about a hundred times and they spoke really fast and loud. Two Frenchmen, they were cuff length apart, they touched each other about 10 times. Two Englishmen, never touched ones. Some of us Alaska Native people, especially those of us are, who are from the village, uh, we like our space. So you just have to pay attention to that. What kind of volume do you use when you're speaking to people? I used to be really soft-spoken until I got used to uh, being in the city and being exposed to the Western culture. I have learned how to speak faster. I've learned how to speak, uh, use pitch. And I learned how to use um, getting closer to Italian distance. And um, I also speak a lot louder than I used to uh, 23 years ago. So you guys have to be mindful of, of these kinds of things. Oh, my husband's trying to call me. <laughs> you have to be mindful about uh, guys, these kinds of things. You just have to realize that there are differences. Um, nobody's style of communication is right or wrong. But according to the Western culture being in the city, uh, Western culture style of communication is the right way. Uh, just, just realize that there are differences. Do we have any questions regarding this? You like my um, dry fish in the background? <laughs> Can we have the next slide up, please? Thank you. All right, communication. I want you guys to, to, to look at that. I thought I'd bring that up so you guys could have a better understanding about tempo, pitch, distance, and volume. Um, you guys can save that as a reminder. Um, when I used to work at the Harriet Center, by the way, I don't work there anymore, uh, not as a full-time staff anymore. I'm just there part-time for the summertime. Um, I do work for Alaska Pacific University. But I, I, I um, recommend that you guys save this as a reminder. I used to have a piece of quote that was written by my grandfather that said something like, um, it doesn't matter how you say it, it's the words you choose. I put that right over my, my work telephone to remind myself. Um, so anyway, uh, any questions regarding this? Before I move on to the next one. Anything in the chats that I'm not seeing? 
because I can't see the chat box from. Okay. Nope, just a great background comment. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> Excuse me. I'm going to go ahead and talk about my stepson who's autistic. Um, when he first started living with us, I had a very challenging time trying to understand him and his uh, disability. And I was so desperate to help him that on my own, I started to research about autism so I could better understand how to help him um, because I had a, a difficult time, a challenging time trying to build a relationship with him. I had a hard time accepting um, also our, our cultural differences. Um, not to make it sound like um, my kids are better, but the differences between both of my stepsons and my children. Um, when I first and got engaged to my husband and we moved in together and I saw the differences between my kids and his kids, um, it was a little bit hard for me um, because with my children, it made, it made me realize when I moved in with him that our people have unintentionally taught our children to always get up and do what before you're asked or told to do. So with my children, when it comes to chores, they would just get up and do, or they would get up and help me when I needed help. Whereas with my stepsons, I had to push them a little bit, and I would hear them constantly complain, 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 and I would never hear my children complain. I told my husband, that made me realize this is the way I was raised. So without realizing it, I unintentionally taught my children that this is how you should be. And so I made these signs and put them all over my house for my stepsons to see. Um, and at the, at the end of each sentence, it said, I never complained. So in random places throughout my house, on the lamp, on my doors, refrigerator door, mirror, bathroom mirrors, their bedroom doors, I posted all these signs because I wanted them to see that this is, this, this is how it was where I come from. Like, for instance, I'll share some of those uh, signs with you, and I did actually post them on Facebook. Um, one says, um, I had to take the trash to the dumps. We had to do it ourselves because we didn't have anybody to come pick up our trash. And when I did it, I never complained. I had to do my daily chores because my parents were trying to teach me how to be responsible because they knew that I was going to know, know that I knew that I needed to know how to do these things. That way, when I started to live on my own, I would know how to do these things, and I never complained. I had to pick up water because we had no running water, and I would use this piece of uh, uh, stick and at the ends of the stick there would be uh, buckets of water with a rope and I would have to pack 10 gallons of water and I never complained. I had to my help my mother pluck duck and cut fish and I never complained. When I was 12 years old I asked my parents to move in my paraplegic grandfather I chose to take care of him because I wanted to take care of him, to show him my appreciation. I used to shave him, cut his hair, clean his nails because he couldn't do that for himself. I used to bathe him and I used to pick him up and put him on the, bat on the toilet and help him use the bathroom and wipe him and clean him. And I never complained. So I posted those things all over my house. And when my family woke up, my husband said, what is this? I said, I just wanted to teach um, my step kids that this is how it is in my culture. We don't complain. So I had a really hard time trying to understand how to communicate with them. And, and something came to me, and, and in my, what came to my mind was 
that I needed to teach my, my stepsons the way that my grandparents taught me. And, uh, and I didn't know how to communicate with them, and especially my autistic stepson. Um, something spoke to me and said, uh, talk to, his name is London, talk to London the way your grandparents used to talk to you. Sit him down and teach him. Um, and so that's how I used to communicate with London. But also being a traditional healer, I've learned also to, um, with my stepson who's autistic, sometimes he has a hard time with communicating things. He has a challenging time. So I, uh, I take the time to read his spirit, his mental, physical being, and I'll tell my husband, no, that's not why he's behaving this way. Uh, that's not the reason why he's behaving this way. This is what I'm feeling from him. He's having a hard time communicating that with you. But this is what I'm feeling from him. And so I use my uh, traditional healing gifts to help my autistic stepson. You just have, And I also take the time to um, teach him about my culture because and our traditional values, when you do that, it helps them with behavior, even if they're um, autistic. It really helps with the behavior. So I exposed him to our Alaska, Alaska Native cultures by taking him, with, taking him with me to work almost every day so he can be exposed to our dances, our traditional values, our worldviews. And so, and he would go with me on my tour sometimes and he began to learn our dances and he would request to dance perform with the dancers on stage and London realized how much he loved the Alaska Native cultures and dancing and one day he asked me, Miss Yari, am I Native? And I didn't know how to respond to that. I had to think about it and I said, London, by blood, you're not Native, but at heart you are. Your, your spirit is Native and, and your heart is Native. As long as you love the Alaska Native cultures and, and want to partake in our traditions and our way of life, then yes, you are Native at heart. So he super loves our Alaska Native cultures. Do we have any questions? I'm going to go ahead and open the floor to um, any discussions. We should have a discussion on all the different things that I talked about and, um, in, and open the floor for questions that you might have. One question in the chat from when you were talking about communication. Um, is it more respectful to talk when on the same level, like both sitting or both standing? Oh, yes. You just have to pay attention. If you see an Alaska Native person, especially those who come from the villages, please don't stand next to them because <laughs> that is very intimidating. You want to mirror them. Just pay attention to um, their body language and just mirror them. Instead of sitting um, right in front of them, don't put a chair right in front of them to speak to them. Put a chair next to them because that will make them feel that you are equal to them versus if you put a chair in front of me and start speaking to me, it makes me feel like you're talking at me and not to me. So there's a difference between talking at me and talking to me. And when an individual is right in front of me and put a chair in front of me, it just makes me feel like you're talking at me, not to me. So I would recommend that you put a chair next to them, uh, especially for those of us who have a challenging time using eye contact because in some of our Alaska Native cultures, eye contact is a, a, is a challenge, um, especially when you get um, disciplined by adults or elders. You never use eye contact with them when you're being disciplined. Whereas in the Western culture, eye contact is a, is a sign of uh, respect. So just pay attention to those things. Anything else? Mirror, pitch, tone, just yes, yes. You just have to pay attention to all those kinds of things. And remember to pause long enough so they can get a chance to speak because if you don't give them that pause they need, you're never going to give them a chance to speak at all. So be mindful of your pauses. 
when I was, yeah, when I was working in speech language and also working with different families, one thing I noticed is we think of Western culture being similar in all places, but across the United States, there are a lot of variants in how people talk, how fast they'll talk, how slow they'll talk, and similar to what you're saying too. So mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's quite interesting, um, especially when you take very country people that have been in Appalachian Mountains or up in the mountains, um, like where I was from. Uh, folks work together and they share a lot, but then you go to other areas and it's completely the di it's completely different. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's you go from fast talking to slow talking and <laughs> all of that in between. So it's it's nice to hear you share um, Alaskan style um, and for us to be mindful that each individual has their their own um, mm -hmm. culture, individual culture, their group culture and the place where they came from. Exactly, yep. Anybody else? I saw in comments something about families, but I didn't get a chance to read that. What did it say? Let me see here. So it says, how about when talking or working with families and who may be the decision maker? Like for me, uh, it really depends on each culture. Some. Some people have advocates in their families. Like um, in my family, I'm the, the spokesperson for my family. If my mom, my brother, my sister need help advocating for them, then I'm the family advocate. So you just have to, it, it's okay to ask families if they have a spokesperson or if they have somebody that advocates for them. But also keep in mind about the clan system. Like for instance, um, when my father was in a four-wheeler accident, because I'm the oldest sibling, that means I am the decision maker in my family, in my immediate family, um, my mom, my dad, my siblings. So when, when my father was at ICU and the doctors told us there was nothing they could do to help him, basically he was brain dead, um, we were trying to decide you know, what to do for our father. And my brother and my sister immediately decided that we need to plug, uh, pull the plug on him. And I said, no, not yet. I need to talk to mom. I need to talk to my uncles, see what they say first, um, because I wanted to include them in um, decision making. And they told me it was basically up to me. And so I, I asked my siblings and the doctor, please give me a couple of days to think about it. So I, I had to think about it very carefully. I had to think about what is best for my father. Um, put my father first before anybody else. And uh, I had to make, uh, two days later, I said, um, it's best that we pull the plug on my dad because I don't want him to basically be a vegetable, you know, be plugged in. And that's not living. And so we pulled the plug on him. So in my culture, usually, usually the oldest sibling is a decision maker. But we also have clan leaders that are decision makers. So you just have to be aware of uh, the culture the people come from. It's okay to ask them questions, but don't overload them with questions. Because when I did that assessment as a teenager, my, my thought of... Um, the counselor was, oh, my gosh, she's so nosy. That's the way she came across to me. She's so nosy. She's asked me too many questions because my grandmother told me that it wasn't okay to ask a lot of questions. So sometimes people come across as nosy. And my husband now knows um, I don't ask a lot of questions. Like um, when I first started dating him, my best friend Joy would ask me things like, so where's Mark? I would say, I don't know. What's he doing? I don't know. Who's he with? I don't know. And, you know, she did that for a while until one day I got tired of it. And I said, if Mark wants to tell me anything about himself, he will certainly tell me. I don't need to know who he's with, what he's doing, or where he is. I just need to know how he's doing. That's all I need to know. And she stopped asking me those questions. And then weeks later, she started asking me that again. Because I'm so comfortable with her, because we've been best friends since we were little girls, I looked at her and said, why don't you call him and ask him yourself? <laughs> and um, 
she would uh, do things like, what's so-and-so doing in town? Where are they staying? Did anybody come with them? When are they going home? And my answer was always, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know, because I don't ask people, why are you in town? Where are you staying? Who came with you? And um, what are you doing here? I don't ask those questions. It's not my business, and I, and I don't need to know these things unless they want to tell me themselves. So there's some Alaska Native people that are, the same way as, as I am. We just don't, we're just unintentionally taught not to ask a lot of questions and easily get irritated when people ask you lots of questions. So just be observant. Anything else? Okay, you're welcome. Um, if you guys don't have anything else, that's all I have for the day. I also want to um, mention one thing real quick, though, is when you work with individuals who are spiritually gifted, there are chances you might run into people who tell you they hear voices or they see things and they hear things. Um, if, if I were to tell you what my spiritual gifts are without telling you I'm a traditional healer, chances are that somebody's going to diagnose me with schizophrenia. So the kids that I worry about um, who are spiritually gifted and they tell you they hear voices, I would recommend that you do a further investigation on what do you mean by you hear voices. Because some kids might tell you things like, I hear the plants speak to me. I hear the water speak to me. Um, there is a little girl ghost that plays with me or, or things like that. You have to pay attention to those kinds of things. There's a difference between somebody who's schizophrenic and somebody who is spiritually gifted. You just have to know the differences. And so the kids I worry about who have spiritual gifts, I'm worried they're going to get diagnosed with schizophrenia. They're going to get referred to the wrong place. They're going to be given medication for the wrong reason. And guess what? It ain't going to go away because these kids are spiritually gifted. So please be mindful of those kinds of things too. If you ever run into things like that and you don't know what to do with it, you can always contact me. Well, I don't have anything else if, if nobody does. You're welcome, everybody. Thank you so much, Harry. Yeah, I really you appreciated for... you being here today and sharing so much about your own history and culture. Um, it was really, it was really insightful. Thank you. Good. I'm glad. I'm glad you guys find it useful. You do have my contact information uh, in my writing. Um, Keep paddling against the wind. It has my cell phone number and my email address listed on there um fyi i like text text messages <laughs> good to know <laughs> okay now right. thank, thank you's you coming in in the chat too yari thank you you're welcome you guys yeah. have a good afternoon you too oh, yeah nice to come up the re you're welcome bye guys bye. have a great day guys thanks everyone have a good day